you, you write about the, the Israeli military at that time has gotten its training from uh, the British, Correct. particularly in their counterinsurgency, because it seems right. like, you know, at one point that military doctrine and training meets up with the sort of um, the completely unabashed. I, I don't know what the best is to describe sort of like that Begin era and forward, but almost a er fascism, if you will, um, that those two things combined. But talk about that military training at that time right. and how right. it is continued. We see it in play today. Yeah. I mean, what happens is during this revolt, the British really lack manpower to put down the Palestinians. Um, this is at a time of crises in Europe where the British need to keep their army alert just in case war erupts with Germany. This is the time of the Sudetenland crisis. This is the time of the Anschluss with Austria, where Hitler's taking over pieces of Central Europe, and the British are afraid they're about to get to a war. So they don't have any, they don't have any reserves. And so a British intelligence officer by the name of Ord Wingate says, let's take some of the guys from the Zionist militias, some of the best uh, 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 leaders in the Palmach and the Haganah. The Palmach is the strike force of the main militia the, of the Haganah. And let's train them together with British soldiers to launch offensive operations. And what he's basically doing is distilling generations of British counterinsurgency doctrine and teaching it to the people who go on to become generals in the Israeli army. So Moshe Dayan is one of his mentees. Uh, Yigal Alon, later a minister is, and chief of staff of the Israeli army, is one of his mentees. Yitzhak Sadeh, who's the chief of staff of the, later on of the Haganah, is one of his mentees, as are dozens and dozens of others who become the elite of the Israeli army. They become the chiefs of staff. They become, in the case of, of Diane, minister of defense later on. And these guys are taught all the brutality, shooting of prisoners, torture, blowing up houses over people's heads that the British have been practicing in Ireland, in India, in other parts of the British empire. So British counterinsurgency doctrine is taught to these guys as part of the, Brit the effort of the British to quell this great revolt. Um, and this is the doctrine which the Israeli army now acknowledges uh, is at the core of their own doctrine. I mean, you read Alon's history of the Israeli army. You read Zeb Schiff's history of the Israeli army. They devote pages and pages to Ord Wingate and British training and British ideas. So, and that has, that has informed the Israeli army long before Begin became prime minister in 1977. That's informed the Israeli army from the 50s onwards. So you have these massacres carried out of villages where uh, uh, so, uh, infiltrators have entered and killed Israelis, they go in and they kill a whole lot of people. And that's the stuff that Ord Wingate and the British uh, counterinsurgency officers trained them to do back in the 1930s when they were young officers. And that is the doctrine of the Israeli army to this day. That's what you see today in Gaza on a much, much, obviously, larger scale. Um, and so uh, in, in 1948, um, uh, following uh, the UN mandate, um, UN the UN partition. Uh, excuse me, UN uh, partition. Um, and uh, uh, I guess it could also be referenced as the, the Nakba. Um, the uh, war begins with uh, Arab countries. Right. Um, uh, this is probably the time that Israel develops its uh, uh, David and Goliath sort of, I guess, um, uh image in the world right um and that sustains it uh and and and, and about another two hundred and fifty thousand palestinians are dispossessed uh in that um uh, in that war having already uh hundreds of thousands um uh more than half a million i think uh, prior to that had uh been actually off actually about three hundred thousand are kicked out expelled uh ethnically cleansed if you will uh in the fighting before the arab armies enter and about another half a million or 400,000 are expelled after four Arab armies enter the war in, on May 15th, 1948. So uh, in, in March and April and May of 48, before the mandate ends, before the British leave, before the state of Israel is created, before the Arab armies enter, um, Jaffa, 70,000 people, Haifa, 70,000 people, Bisan, Safa, Tiberias, all fall, and their populations are kicked out. And West Jerusalem, 30,000 people are kicked out. So you have hundreds of thousands of people driven from their homes before the Arab armies enter. And then another four or four or 500,000 uh, after the Arab armies enters. And, and so you have four Arab armies that enter, the Egyptian, the Syrian, the Iraqi, and the Jordanian. 
Um, and, and, and that's the Arab-Israeli war that we think of. But what people forget is that long before this, there was a war going on. From the moment the, the partition resolution is adopted, the Palestinians re re refuse it. They reject it. They say, this is our country. We're the majority. We're entitled to self-determination under the UN Charter. Why are we not being given it? Why is most of our country being turned into a Jewish state? 58% uh, uh, was to, 55 was to be given to the Jewish state. And by the end of the war, as you said, almost 80% has been conquered by Israel, with the people, most of the population, uh, ethnically cleansed. And so uh, what, 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 how would you characterize those next 20 years until the 67 uh, war? Well, a lot of things are happening that people don't pay much attention to. Most of the land uh, in what becomes the state of Israel is Arab owned. Uh, Jewish owner ownership was about 6% in 1948. Uh, and what happens is everybody who's left has their land confiscated. It's put under a custodian of absentee property and it's handed over to Jewish settlements, Jewish communities, or kept by the state, Israel Lands Authority. Um, m most of the land, about half of the land of Palestinians who stayed behind in Israel and become citizens of the state of Israel is taken from them, confiscated in different ways. And their communities are restricted to very tiny spaces. They're never allowed to build outside of very restrictive municipal boundaries. So you have a city like Nazareth, which is surrounded with Jewish settlements such that it can't expand. Or you have other, other uh, c communities in, inside Israel of Palestinians. Um, that's happening without anybody paying attention. Uh, Palestinians inside Israel, citizens of the state of Israel, are under martial law from 1948 until 1966. They have to get a permit from the military governor, in most cases, to even go from city to city. Um, they are in, they're, they're under surveillance by the Shabbat, by the general security services. Um, they live under martial law, even though they're supposedly citizens and they have the right to vote. Uh, meanwhile, the 750,000 people who are expelled uh, live as refugees, whether in the Gaza Strip, where all of the Palestinians from southern, what becomes southern Israel, are confined under Egyptian military administration, or in the Gaza, or in the West Bank, or in Jordan, or in Syria, or in Lebanon. And the the 67 war um, is, uh, again, um, uh, ostensibly a, a defensive war uh, by uh, Israel at this point, and they uh, successfully um, essentially take, uh, at that time, the, the Sinai and, right. uh, and the West Bank um, and, um, and the Golan Heights, and the Golan Heights uh, from uh, uh, Syria. What, like, how... Where was the United States in terms of like army? Like where? Like where? Where did that Israeli uh, military might come from? Um, and was it? Uh, how uh, preordained was that victory based upon uh, their strength? Well, I, 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 in the book, I quote you know General Wheeler, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and the President Johnson at the time, talking. Uh, to the Israeli envoy who was sent to Washington to get a green light for this war. And he says, you're going to whip them anyway. If they attack you first, you'll beat them. And if you launch a preemptive strike, you'll just crush them. So the estimation of American military intelligence and the CIA was that Israel was vastly superior to all the Arab armies put together, um, even if they had, if, even if the Arabs had attacked, as the Israelis were saying they might do. Um, we now know that they probably couldn't and wouldn't attack, but the Israelis thought they might. But they intended to preempt. And what they went to Washington, what they sent an envoy to Washington to get was a green light for an Israeli preemptive war and for Isra American support in the wake of that. Now, the military uh, might that Israel had in 1967 was essentially based on French and British weapons. Uh, Americans' weapon shipments had only just begun. Israel was just getting anti-aircraft missiles, Hawk anti-aircraft missiles, and some uh, Skyhawk bombers came a little later. But essentially, they fought the war with mirages and with French and British tanks and artillery. Um, only after 67 do American weapons become the core element in Israel's military might. Uh, Phantom fight, F-4 Phantoms uh, starting in 1968. Uh, top of the line, the best fighter bomber in the world uh, starts to be supplied only in 1968. So they fight the war with French and British equipment, but with American diplomatic support. And uh, what happens to the Palestinian population there? Are more uh, dispossessed or is it just simply more who become occupied? Well, the ones who are in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and uh, 
at Sinai and, and, and the Golan Heights for the Egyptians and Syrians who lived there, they go, come under military occupation. But uh, in the meantime, Israel expels about 300,000 more people from villages to the west of Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, um, from refugee camps in the Jordan River Valley, uh, and many others who are outside are kept outside. So another quarter of a million, 300,000 are expelled in the wake, uh, Palestinians are expelled in the wake of the 67 war. Um, can you now like track for us to sort of like what's happening with Palestinian nationalism? Because you write that this is uh, around the beginning of an era where Palestinian nationalism has its most success politically. Right. Um, there is uh, certainly um, moments of, I guess, uh, you know, you could call terrorism and uh, in some instances um, that, uh, but primarily the gains are happening uh in terms of of uh, of politics right can you walk us through that a little bit yeah um i mean what happens after 1948 is a is a is a is a complete devastation of the palestinian national movement it's already crushed by the british in the late 30s uh the sort of coup de grace comes uh, with the nakba um, the, the elites in the, in the coastal cities are driven into exile. Everybody loses everything. Um, everybody who's expelled loses everything. Many of the people who stay behind lose everything. Um, and it takes a long time for the Palestinian national movement to rebuild itself. And this happens in the 50s and 60s. And by the 1960s, um, you have a Palestine liberation organization, which is taken over by these commando uh, organizations, which preach armed struggle against Israel, which call for the liberation of Palestine. Um, and which, you know, ignite the imagination, not just of Palestinians, but of people all over the Arab world in the wake of the defeat of these Arab armies, the Egyptian, the Syrian, and the Jordanian in the, in the 67 war. But their major victories, exactly as you say, are actually diplomatic and political. Uh, they gain the support of over 100 countries the world over uh, who end up uh, having, you know, Palestinian embassies in their capitals. Um, they, for the first time, the Palestinians uh, address uh, the world, uh, Palestinian representatives come to the UN, Arafat and others come to the UN and speak on behalf of the Palestine cause. And that's something that the British prevented back in the day. That's something that doesn't happen in 1947. Partition is decided over the heads of the Palestinians. They're never consulted about the partition of their own country. So what happens in the 70s and 80s is a resurgence of the Palestinian cause, but mainly, as you say, on the political and diplomatic level. Their military achievements are nil or very, very limited. What what accounts of that? I mean, is this simply because we have like a, um, uh, 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 in some ways, a, a global liberation movement? Is it because the U.S. is, um, because there is, a, because of the Cold War, there is this sort of sense of like, uh, we need to recognize in, in, indigenous people? I mean, this is an era where in this country, certainly there was a more recognition of uh, of of our responsibility to indigenous people and to the, right. the sort of wholesale slaughter and you know uh, we're, we're there's a there's a whole lot of like sort of intellectual movements happening at this time uh, in the eighties there was a lot of um, the, there were there were a series of new historians who got access to Israeli documents that showed what what I mean th is that part of what had happened in that era. Yeah, I think I think it really starts with the era of decolonization, and the Palestinians ride that wave. In other, in other words, they argue that you all have gotten free from colonialism, you all have established your independent states. People in Africa, people in Asia, uh, uh, are liberated from European colonialism in the wake of World War II, and the Palestinians get a lot of support globally um, on the basis of that argument. We never got our independence. We were colonized, the British, the Zionists. Um, and we, we, you know, are, are like you, a people that desires self-determination. And that's where you get the support in the United Nations to this day um, for elements of the Palestinian narrative. Um, I, I think you're also right that, that uh, in this country, there's the beginnings in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but very limited stirrings of support for the Palestinians. I don't think that the main narrative uh, changes. The main narrative is essentially established by Israel and its supporters in the United States, link the establishment of Israel to the persecution of Jews in Europe, link the establishment of Israel uh, to, you know, an ancestral link to the Holy Land, link the establishment of Israel, most importantly, to the Holocaust and, and, and to Western guilt about the fact that not more was done to save people 
uh, from the Holocaust, Jew Jews who could have been saved from the Holocaust. Had the United States opened the gates of immigration before World War II, uh, huge numbers of people could have been saved or had other countries done so. Um, so there's a lot of guilt uh, for good reasons. They, they should have been guilty. They were guilty. Um, and that, I think, helped to, to fuel a narrative where the Palestinians are simply removed from the picture. Nobody sees them. Um, and that begins to change, as you say, probably in the 80s, partly as a result as, uh, of, of revelations from the Israeli archives that most of what Israelis have argued about what happened in 1948 was false. Palestinians didn't leave because their leaders told them to. They left at the point of a bayonet or because they were terrified uh, and because their cities were being bombarded with David mortars or, or, or there were you know, attacks on, on, on their you know, convoys and supply routes and so on and so forth. So that, those realities begin to intrude uh, in, into, the, into the narrative. But I think we still have a long way to go to get rid of some of the mo mo most pernicious myths uh, about this, about this, uh, this war. Uh, uh, without a doubt. In fact, that's uh, partly a uh, uh, large reason why we wanted to, to speak with you. Um, I'm, I'm also fa uh, 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 fascinated by the history. So as we move forward and uh, the PLO is in exile, or at least leadership is, right. um, and, um, the, uh, uh, the, this, this chapter with uh, Iqbal uh, Ahmed, uh, who right. I had never been uh, familiar with, uh, a Pakistani intellectual who was also a revolutionary and involved in other uh, revolutionary uh, movements around the globe, uh, meets in, in Lebanon. When, when was that in, in terms of uh, the timing and, um, right. and, and, and what did he uh, tell us about his role here? All right. Well, Iqbal Ahmed um, was, as you say, a Pakistani intellectual. He had worked with Franz Fanon briefly uh, uh, as part of the Fr FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, the Algerian National Movement against French colonialism. Um, and he ended up teaching here in the United States at, I think, Hampshire College. Um, he wrote a number of influential works. Um, but he was always you know, in touch with liberation movements and with you know, progressive thought. And he was asked to come to Lebanon by the PLO to assess their militaries, to stress it, to assess their strategy. And as I as I mentioned in the book, he came back and he said, "You guys are going about it all wrong." You know, I have nothing against violence. I mean, he had worked with the FLN in Algeria. <laughs> they liberated Algeria through enormous violence, much of it directed against civilians, by the way, um, and against French settlers, uh, civilians. Um, he said, "But against this enemy." you're going about it the wrong way. This will not work. Uh, uh, violence against Israelis actually cements the strength of Israeli society. So he, he gave them a, he gave them his assessment. They didn't like it. Um, and he went back to the United States. Um, and I quote this in the book uh, as, as, as something that I think people should be thinking about. Um, you know, I think that what we've seen after October 7th, the triggering of trauma that has nothing to do with Palestine or Israel or, or the specific you know war we're talking about, but pre-existing trauma, um, going right back to the Holocaust. I mean, I, I've heard discussions of Kishinev, I've heard discussions of, of pogroms, I've heard, of course, discussions of the Holocaust, cited by people as what October seventh did force them to think about. Uh, and and I think I think Iqbal Ahmed was gesturing to the same kind of problem. Um, in 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 this in this assessment that he wrote for the PLO, well, uh, can, can when, you, uh, when was when was that yeah. exactly? That would have been, I think, nineteen seventy nine or eighty. I can't remember the date. It's I think it's in the book. Can, uh, yeah, I mean, before nineteen eighty two, before the PLO had to leave Lebanon. Can you expand a little bit on that notion? Because um, we, we played this on the program before. Netanyahu has uh, came under fire a few years ago for um, spreading a conspiracy theory that the Palestinian Grand Mufti was uh, actually responsible for planting the idea of exterminating the Jews in Hitler's head and that Hitler did not want to do that. That was actually the Palestinians. Um, now... I mean, this is a, an extreme example. I mean, this is it's not even that extreme because he's the leader, at least within the context of Israeli society, because he's the leader of the country. But like this is kind of that progression of what you're talking about, of the linking of uh, of pa Palestinian uh, nationalism and, and their efforts to to fight back against colonialism with the trauma of the Holocaust. Right. Um, 
in a false way. Right, right. Well, I mean, this has been a big effort of Zionist propaganda ever since World War II to link Palestinian nationalism and in particular the Mufti to the Nazis. And of course, the Mufti was linked to the Nazis. Um, he, he took refuge in, in Berlin. He fled Palestine when the British arrested all of his colleagues in 1937. He was in Beirut for a long period of time. And then he had to flee Beirut when the French were going to hand him over to the British. And he went to Iraq. He had to flee Iraq when the British took, reinvaded Iraq. He went to Tehran. The Iranians wouldn't let him stay. He went to Turkey. The Turks wouldn't let him stay. So he ends up in Italy and he then goes to Germany. And he spends the war supporting the Nazi war effort. What nobody talks about is that most other Palestinian leaders supported the British. The Mufti was in Germany. The other guys were supporting the British war effort. And thousands of Palestinians and hundreds of thousands of Arabs fought in the Allied armies. Uh, the divisions that liberated Marseille from the Nazis in 1944 were a Moroccan and an Algerian division with French officers. And there were thousands of Palestinians who fought, or Jordanians or others, who fought in the Allied ranks. So yes, the Mufti went to Germany. But there's nothing, there nothing Nazi or anti-Semitic about Palestinian nationalism. Um, even if the even if the Mufti himself allied himself uh, with the Nazis. By the way, he disappears from Palestinian politics immediately after World War II. He's completely discredited after World War II. So, but he is a iconic figure for Israeli propaganda <clears throat> simply because he did in fact go to Germany and he did in fact align himself uh, with with the Nazis. Uh, uh, Netanyahu's claim is absolutely preposterous. You only have to read Mein Kampf, which was written long before the Mufti ever arrived in Germany to understand Hitler's absolute hatred of the Jews and his desire to eliminate them from Germany. That did not come from the Mufti or the Arabs. Uh, it came from you know, deep-rooted German anti-Semitism.